when you look at an MRI or a CT scan and you're less familiar with what's going on, the best thing you can do is to get the radiologic report and go through the MRI reading this report. The radiologist for the most part should have diagnosed most of the impending problems and you can follow along with the MRI imaging report to understand how to interpret an MRI or a CT scan. We're now going to discuss CT images, myelograms, and the CT myelogram. The CT myelogram used to be the great tool for understanding spine pathology. It is no longer as good a tool as it used to be because MRI has supplanted it, but it still has purposes. We'll go over all those purposes. We're going to start off with a normal CT scan of the thoracolumbar junction. I picked this image because it shows perfectly the architecture of the vertebra with the trabecula, the end plates that are made obviously of cancel, cortical bone rather. You can see the beginnings of the cartilaginous end plates that are going to form the epiphysis and you can see a perfect apophysis here between the posterior elements and the anterior elements. This is why CT is better for bone in general than an MRI is. This is to remind everybody that again the spinal canal changes in volume with flexion extension. With flexion it opens by 30 percent and with extension narrows quite a bit. So flexion extension is an important part of understanding the pathoanatomy of the spine. This is a myelogram lateral x-ray view of the lumbar spine of a patient who has significant central stenosis at L3-4. This is a great view to indicate what happens on flexion versus extension. If you look very carefully right in this area, you'll see dye that flows from the top of L3 down below L4, and that dye pattern disappears completely in a cutoff sign when the patient extends, a good indicator of what happens in the spine with flexion versus extension in the face of stenosis. This is a lateral myelogram of a patient with a big disc herniation and central stenosis. You can see at the level of the other discs there are disc bulges and it does narrow the canal somewhat but here it appears to be a disc herniation and with the apple core sign as we call it this is significant narrowing and this is a patient who's probably going to have neurogenic claudication. Again on the AP, this is what the cascading myelogram looks like above and below the level of the cutoff and here we see no dye indicating significant narrowing of the canal. This is a myelogram of the nerve root and again you have to remember what you're looking at. If you look carefully you can see the Scotty dog again with the ear, the nose, the eye and the foreleg but what you want to follow is you want to follow the nerve root. These are the cascading nerve roots. And if we get here, we can see the nerve root has dye continuing down along the disc space. The dye ends right here. That's where the dorsal root ganglion starts, and dye won't go beyond that point. But you can see this is a normal root at L4 on the left. And on the right side, you can follow the nerve root to here, but then you lose the nerve root at the disc level and you can imagine in your mind's eye a disc herniation compressing that root and creating the cutoff preventing the dye from flowing down the root. Now we start to get into the CT myelogram. So obviously you don't have everything superimposed. These are single, single slices and you can look at the vertebra, you can look at the dye. Here is the spinal cord ending at the cauda equina behind L1, and you can see a large deficit here at L4-5, a significant block. Here on this image, if you look carefully, you can see the left nerve root, and that's fully opaque and visible, and the right one is cut off here, and that's simply because of the disc herniation protruding, preventing the dye from filling that root sac. This demonstrates a CT scan. Actually, it's a post-discogram, as you can see the dye within the disc. Uh, 
but it's great to look at bony architecture. Again, this can be seen on an MRI, but here on an x-ray, you can see perfect degenerative changes. You can see the erosion of the end plate, a cyst, thinning, and spur formation. Again, sometimes CTs are more valuable than MRIs. The CT is valuable because sometimes MRIs can't pick up bony surfaces. Again, if you look at the MRI image, whatever is black is typically bone, tendon, or ligament. So here you can define there's an ossicle that's grown off of the superior facet creating foraminal stenosis. So sometimes CTs are quite valuable. Again, down here, you can see a bone spur growing back from the body of L5. You can imagine the nerve root in there could theoretically be compressed by that. On, sat, I'm sorry, on axial images, you can nicely see facet subluxation and degenerative change. This facet is somewhat degenerative, but still relatively intact, and the alignment is normal. But we get here, we see this facet is subluxed forward on this one. This is very typical with the degenerative spondylolisthesis. You can imagine the spur on the anterior tip of this as you stand up pushing forward and compressing the nerve root, creating lateral recess stenosis. This is a CT myelogram of a normal level and the level below of stenosis. On the normal level, again, the sac, the thecal sac, is full of dye, and the two starting to exit nerve roots are also full of dye. This is relatively normal. And if we get to the next image, you can see that the thecal sac is very thinned. You can see black here from the thickened ligamentum flavum, and a little black here from the disc, creating significant stenosis. Again, there's different types of stenosis. The last one we saw, ligamentum flavum, here is facet that's ingrowing and creating significant narrowing. And here is, again is lateral recess stenosis from the degenerative facet spurs, as well as thickened ligamentum flavum, all creating lateral recess and central stenosis. CTs are valuable looking at discs. If you have localized pain only on one side, you can pick this up with an MRI, but it's easier to see on a CT scan where this is a healthy disc here, a healthy disc here, and this disc is very degenerative with the typical sclerosis of the end plates, the invagination of the trabecula with greater bone, and cyst formation and spur formation. This is typical unilateral degenerative disc disease. Where the CTs are valuable, quite valuable, is determining pars fractures and whether they're healing. MRIs are not very good for this. And here you can see a pars fracture here at L3 and another pars fracture at L5. This is a CT scan, a lateral view, showing the obvious pars fracture at L4. Here we can see the intact L5 pars and the intact L3 pars but the four level has a pars fracture. You can get a determination of the age looking at the ends of the fracture to see if they're rough or smooth. And on the axial view, this is what a pars fracture will look like bilaterally. Here's another kid who's quite young and had a fracture, and you can look at the age of the fracture. The bone ends are rounded. There is a slip here. This fracture probably occurred much earlier, and he's been living with it and developed pain subsequently. There are patients who come into my office after they've had surgery at other places, and they develop increased pain. There are times you can have an iatrogenic fracture, where you have somebody coming in and taking some bone away and thinning down the area enough where you can get a fracture. And here's a great example of a facet fracture, where on the right side, the facet is intact into the lamina. And on the left side, you can see the fracture right through here. This is, again, a good example L4, where you see the fully intact facet interlocking with L5. But L5 has a fracture through the pars, and this facet is a free-floating fragment. Again, we talked about SI joint problems, and they can be determined sometimes with a CT as well as an MR. And to see these, these erosions is the beginning 
of a spondyloarthropathy. And a CT can lead to the diagnosis of a spondyloarthropathy. You can see a relatively normal CT scan on the right side, but you go to the left side and there's an autofusion, and this is typical with one of the spondyloarthropathies that isn't ankylosing spondylitis.